on this episode of May TV. That's an old, old, old rifle. Now they call them a 3030, but it used to be 30 WCF. We were lucky enough to open a fiddle school, so there's there's Métis of all ages. As soon as you get out into uh, nature, you'll hear our elders speak about our connection to the land and how without the land, we're not who we truly are. I round this off, shave it down, and then fit it into here. And that year we came back to Rocky Mountain House and we were to go across the mountains for sure. The next spring, we went across the mountains and found a Kootenai house. Tanse and welcome to May TV. Today's episode is going to take us across the province of British Columbia, from the ranch lands of Merritt to the mountains and rivers of the East Kootenai. But first, we're staying right here in the Lower Mainland, where we have recently relaunched a chartered community in the city of Surrey. Region 2 Director Louis de Jager and I convened a panel to discuss this and more. Welcome to May TV, uh, Carmen, Lee, and uh, Minister Jagger. Thanks so much. Uh, before we get started on the program today, I just thought I would uh, take a moment to provide you just with a little gift, a token of uh, my appreciation and from the show. Over to you, Carmen, and over to you, Lee. And also, uh, thank you very much for um, for you. your willingness to thank share you. your story with us here on May TV. So we're going to kick it off with. I'm going to start it off with Lee. Uh, you've been involved with our community uh, in the past. Tell us a little bit about what brought you back. Uh, I've been um, sort of out of action for a couple of years except for my beading group. I've always had a beading circle that we've managed to keep going on Zoom and I just decided that I wanted to get back to the grassroots community and get involved again and I just really wanted to get back to connecting with with the community. Awesome. And Carmen, you were uh, just recently elected to uh, Region 2 as the women's rep. What was the main inspiration for you to put your name forward uh, for public office? Well, I too have been involved with Métis politics and that was back in the 90s uh, before I had my family. I've always been a strong feminist. I've always had a love of politics and an interest in politics. So in raising my kids, who I've always taught to be really politically aware and active, I always believe in leading by example and I've always w wanted to get back into Métis politics. So. Um, I thought it was a, an area where I could put my passion and my energy and hopefully some of my lived experience. Well, that's awesome, and uh, I always applaud anyone who puts their name forward for public office, so uh, congratulations again on, on your victory. And, and Minister DeJager, I know you've been very active in this community and very active in the Surrey Delta area. Tell us a little bit about what's been going on. You know, there's been such a demand out there, and, and people um, have been saying, you know, where is the voice? Where is the presence? So there has been a gap out, out here for probably close to three years. And uh, there's such a demand and hunger for um, not just the culture, but, uh, you know, the knowledge. Um, people want to know, and, and young kids want to know. The schools want to know. And uh, it's, it's just demand. We can't seem to have enough people to go into the schools and, and present programs. So we really took a hard look at, at Surrey and Delta, tried to figure out what those gaps were, and now we've reformed um, the community that was here, which because of COVID and whatever other reasons, weren't quite active, and we've decided to uh, light that fire again and uh, organize the uh, Surrey and Delta Métis Association. So that's where we're at, and uh, we actually have a home uh, right in Cloverdale, right across from the uh, Surrey uh, Cloverdale Library, and, um, and we're on our way. So Carmen or Lee, maybe you can weigh in here. What can people expect when the new chartered community is kind of up and running? And, and uh, if someone is watching the program today and they'd like to get involved, maybe you could uh, shed some light on that. So far, we've got set up with um, in the office sharing with Waichea. And um, I think it's Wednesdays. Uh, we have a lunch for seniors that can come and drop in. We want to have activities for youth. We definitely want to have cultural um, activities there, we'll have some jigging, we'll have um, beating circles, coffee circles, that kind of thing. Different things for different people. 
That's great. So did you want to weigh in on that as well, Carmen? Well, I would yeah. just sort of piggyback on what Louis was saying that, uh, of course, we want to look at some of the other social issues uh, in terms of health care, education, huge that we want to have a presence in the school system. Uh, we need our Métis representation. As well, yesterday there was a report that came out on Métis health, so I think we have a unique opportunity. Um, to be a voice uh, in Fraser Health for sure. Mm -hmm. And Minister DeJager, you've uh, you've had some involvement in Chilliwack and other. Are there other school districts that are uh, welcoming and kind of open to this and, and eager for that knowledge for uh, Métis culture and heritage? Yeah, I think it's a work in progress. You know, there's uh, different school districts are at different levels, and that's why we so desperately need a presence out here in Surrey and Delta is to uh, to solidify those relationships. Carmen Calier, thank you very much for being on the program. Lee Fraser, thank you as well, and Minister DeJager. Really appreciate Jim you taking Quinch. a few minutes to, uh, to talk about my favorite topic. Thanks so much. Thank you. We're taking a short break. When we come back, Métis artist Lisa Shepard will take us to Merritt, where we will meet Don Boucher, a Métis elder and lifelong cowboy. It's a root cellar. So I keep my potatoes all winter, and my, the canning is tough in here. Okay, things like potatoes and beets and yeah. canning and... Yeah and that kind of thing. And it's just built into the side of the hill. Yeah. So it just naturally stays cool. Yeah. Welcome back. Ever since our first episode last year, Métis artist Lisa Shepard has traveled the province and shared with us the stories of Métis Kitayaks, which means old ones in Michif. Today, she'll take us to Merritt for a history lesson with Métis elder and lifelong cowboy, Don Beauchene. Cowboy for quite a few years. Yeah, we are cowboy for. And uh, he worked for Douglas Lake Ranch. So, did you come from a cowboying family, like mm, before you? Well, or they... no. My dad was a carpenter. A carpenter. And my grandfather was a carpenter. How did you end up doing this? I uh, guess on my ancestors on the Boyer side, they were cowboys. Oh, I see. Yeah, my grandparents, my great grandparents. There's no record of them. They were Montagnier. Right. That, and they used to travel all over the north. eh? So they said they were born someplace in northern Manitoba, someplace. But the stories passed down in your family, like you know about them because you were told about them. Yeah. 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 And they were, they were Montagnier. Uh, my mom would never admit she's Métis. Never. No. no. She was French. But she talked Métis. Well, these are wild horses. Horses know you, you know if you got a bad spirit or a good spirit. Yeah. Is there much of a cowboying culture still? It's not the same. Not the same. No, there's, What's there's different? cowboys out there. They're more interested in how they look than doing the work, right? I don't know. You look good. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't got enough money to pay you. We have a we have a tradition too. Uh, it's the sashing. Don can tell you more about the sashing. Ah, yeah. So the first grandchild, right? Eh? So you give her you give her her sash. Your sister, you sit her, that's where the grandmother sat. Okay. So you sit her in the middle of the room, they give her a bouquet of, of uh, roses, gotta be roses. Roses. And you dance a jig around her. That's the first grandchild. And uh, elders, when they reach 75, yeah. I don't have uh, a grandfather, the elders sat. I used to have one. They, they gave them a, they could do the same thing again when they reached 75 and they danced a jig around them. This one here was for the out guards in uh, the Buffalo Hunt. You yeah. know, they always had, they had t 10 men to each captain. Okay. And then uh, each, each outfit, like the, you had the out guards and you had in guards. This was given to the out guards of the, the Buffalo Hunt, see? Eh? And the red one, I haven't got it anymore. But there's another colored one for the inside. 
when they came together with their carts, they were forming like a protective circle, is that? Yeah, yeah all the shafts were out and they were all tied in. And what was in the middle? That's where they, that's where their fire, that's where they cooked in okay. the middle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the, the livestock was in the center. And outside there was pits, rifle pits, see? Okay. Yeah. And this would be where? Like where would this take place? Wherever they were on a buffalo hunt. This is your root cellar? Yeah. It's a root cellar so where I keep my potatoes all winter and my, the canning and stuff in here. Okay. Things like potatoes and beets and yeah. tanning and, yeah. and that kind of thing. And it's just built into the side of the hill. Yeah. So it just naturally stays cool. Yeah. Like, you know, like at night, we used to put juniper on top of the fire. Yeah. So it kills the smell in the camp. There's no smell. So then you put the kids through it. You know, the animals, they can't smell and they can't find them, right? I didn't know that about juniper. No. 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 Yeah. No, I know that juniper is really nice with wild meat. Yeah, but like I know taste-wise that it goes with it, but... If you want to get rid of smell, you use juniper. Here's another one of my inventions. See? What is it? You, you drag it, and it makes your rows straight, see? When you're planting. Get out! That's so, that's clever and so simple. I just put rocks on there to make it heavier, and then the, the, the potatoes, they're, they're just wide enough for my rototiller to go between it, and you drag that. So that's how you got all these rows straight, yeah. is just with this? Yeah. Oh, I gotta show you how to tie a feed or not. That goes on a, on a hackamore. See, you grab this like that, turn it like so. Take this, pass it through here. Now everything's gotta come out through the center. So you grab this one into here. And you take this one, comes back over here. I got two in there. <laughs> Did you catch yeah. all that? Not a chance. Like, not a chance. How you remember that? You know, sometimes I don't remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when Don drops off to, to, to uh, go further on, there's going to be nobody there to pick up the knowledge. It's got to be documented. That's one of the biggest things that we have to look strongly to going forward with is getting it documented so people can actually remember the language and pick up the language and hear the stories. And, yeah, you know, when they had those camp out, say, a kid uh, come of age, sir, he had to have a, uh, get it, they'd give him a pocket knife, see? Eh? Okay. Every young kid wanted a pocket knife. Uh, a Métis without a pocket knife, he's not Métis. Right. No, he's got to have a pocket knife yeah. all the time, see? Eh? Yeah. On the side. Always. Yeah. And I've got several of them. <laughs> and here's my tomato, see? And there's even tomatoes growing on there. They're not supposed to be yes. growing that fast. They even got some big ones underneath here, see? What else do you have here? And well, I took out the rad radishes. The onions are gone. And I still got some of the zucchini here. Yeah. And there's uh, pickles, uh, cucumbers, and some turnips. And that is a hunting outfit. I don't know much about this at all. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it was probably made in a 19... 40, that rifle. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. It's an old rifle. It's very old. And then you lift this up, and you look through there. And that's how you sight? And you <laughs> oh, wow. And that, that's an old, old, old rifle. Now they call them a 30-30, but okay. it used to be 30 WCF. I have a little something for you to thank you. Oh, yeah? <laughs> and? Well, that's for you. Oh. You can open it. I can? Yeah. I like the color shirt you're wearing. You'll see why. Oh. It goes with your shirt. Yeah, right color. Yeah, it goes with what you're wearing. Yeah. Did you learn something? I did learn oh. something, yes. Good. Yes. How do you know I'm not telling you a whole bunch of baloney stories? You know, if you are, I'm just buying right into it because <laughs> they're good stories. Oh. So I'm okay with that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just don't think that you would. Because I just believe that you care about passing on well, these stories. So I, would, I, I trust uh, that they're going to yeah, be truthful. I do. Well, I, don't, I don't know how many years I got left. Probably not that many. I don't think so. And that's what you want to do in that time? Yeah. I hope to. But I, don't I hope it. you do too. Yeah. yeah, I really do.
Elders like Dawn provide us with a living link to our past. Preserving our Métis culture and heritage is such a crucial task. That's why we recently launched the Métis Speaker Series, a new podcast to generate discussion and raise awareness of Métis culture. If you're interested in the podcast and would like to learn more, please visit MétisPodcastSeries.ca. We're taking a short break now, but when we come back, we'll be heading out to the Kootenai region to speak with Métis citizen and backcountry educator, Alex Ibbotson. When I started exploring my Métis history, it, it really started making sense to me why I love being on the land so much. Welcome back. I'm here in the beautiful Kimberley Alpine Resort in Kimberley, British Columbia. I'm here with Alex Ibbotson and I'm very excited to be able to talk to you a little bit today about this beautiful backcountry, this beautiful part of British Columbia. And Alex, you love the backcountry. I've read your bio. I know that you love being out in the backcountry. Why is it so special to be out in this part of the world? I, when I started exploring my Métis history, it, it really started making sense to me why I love being on the land so much. Um, I have uh, within my ancestry an Assiniboine guide who is also Métis. And um, just kind of when you're out in nature, particularly when you're out in nature with other people, the connection, the bond, uh, connecting to the land, it's hard to explain how grounding it is. Tell me a little bit about on the land training. I understand you're involved in that. With Canada Backcountry Services, my own company, uh, proudly Indigenous company, I do safety training on the land, first aid training, avalanche skills training, and snowmobile mountain riding. And I have a dream in this area to create a center for youth to come and receive training to have employable skills, focusing on Indigenous youth ages 18 to 25. Mm -hmm. That's an underserved uh, age group right now. Focusing on Indigenous, but not exclusive, because we do want the inclusion and we want a diverse group of people coming together. So what we want to do is train people for entrance level employable skills to test out different industries. We have quite a few different environmental jobs available, industry jobs available in this region. And then myself as a backcountry guide and safety educator, there are educational pathways that are little different than what we typically tell our youth so just giving another option and then I, I the word adventure uh, when I popped and, and kind of googled you and looked at your bio comes up a lot what does it mean to you to adventure out and I mean in what is clearly one of the you know the Rocky Mountains you've got the valley it's just so beautiful here it must be just amazing to be able to just get in your truck and take off as soon as you get out into uh, nature, you'll hear our elders speak about our connection to the land and how without the land, we're not who we truly are. So adventure, really in the day to day, when we come up against challenges or there's situations like COVID has been creating for every every individual a, a immense change. Um, you get into nature and you start seeing the changing, here we have the changing larches and mm -hmm. it shows you that, you know, with with change, there's also new beginnings, mm -hmm. creation and opportunities. So nature is kind of like our, our greatest complex system that shows us that we have uh, the ability to self-organize and adapt. So mm -hmm. humans, uh, when we get out into a natural environment, it shows, it models the way for ourselves as people to adapt. And I think it was the local nature that um, actually inspired that sash that we're looking at. I'm looking at yeah. right now, we're all looking at it. It's so beautiful. And tell our viewers a little bit about it because when I look at that sash, I pick up a lot of the colors around here. Yeah, you bet. It, it was done on a loom. So there is finger weaving. And so did you do that yourself? Because I, I certainly couldn't do that. <laughs> you bet. It, it took a lot of perseverance because there were several hours that went into it. And um, I, I selected my colors based on the nature we see here today. So you can't really see it behind us. It's actually happening as we speak. Uh, snow's coming onto the mountaintops. We have our larches, our uh, Kootenai River is this beautiful blue color. And then also our Alpine lakes go that color. And then we have our Reddit Osri dogwood, our Saskatoon berries, um, and then the 
Rocky Mountains as well. So you must have taken some time to obviously think about each and every one of those colors going into that before you 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 pulled it together. Well, I know I love these color combinations just being in this area and seeing it around me, particularly right now, this time of year, you go on social media and locals are just flooding their feeds with these beautiful hikes with snow and these larches that we see in the Kootenai Kootenai area that you don't see everywhere else. And um, yeah, it's interesting as an artist when you kind of bring your story, your color story together. It isn't like right out of the gates. It sort of comes together as, mm -hmm. as your artistic creative juices start flowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that, that sash is not only a piece of clothing, it is a piece of artwork. And Alex, on that note, I want to thank you so much for joining me up here at this beautiful resort and on this beautiful day. And uh, thanks so much for being on May TV. Thank you very much for coming. We'll be right back. I cut pieces in a square and then drew the round circle of it. And to get the strength, I put together two pieces. So what they did was they doweled to hold things together. Welcome back. In this segment, we stay in the East Kootenays. Dan Innes is a Métis elder and a woodworker who lives just outside of Cranbrook. After a long career as a blaster in local mines, he has turned his focus to helping his local Métis community. The uh, Métis group in Cranbrook was there and I joined it about 20 some years ago. When the mine closed here and I retired, I was getting more involved with it and that's when they decided they would like a little cart for their uh, community garden that they look after there. I knew what the cart was and the history of it, so I decided I would make it out of local woods because that was the tradition of the cart. Doing it, I felt that the wheels would probably be the hardest. So I thought, well, I'll start with the wheels and I'll start putting them together. What I did was went out in the bush and found a piece of cedar. Out of a piece of wood like that, I would come up with this. And then uh, I would actually make the spokes out of uh, splitting them. And I used what they had in those days too was a fro. Even in those days, they had a fro to split wood for their cabins. And I picked up a fro and felt that I could split spokes out of it. So I cut a piece of wood like this. And then what I do is, is uh, basically split it. And then I get a spoke. I round this off shave it down, and then fit it into here. My biggest memories are when we went, of course, to Creston and talked to Grandma and her traveling out of Atosh in the Métis cart to get away. That in itself was, was uh, amazing to me. My grandmother, when she did pass away, uh, she reverted to the native language and we were told it was just gibberish because we didn't understand the language. Actually, it was my cousin found out that we were Métis and then I brought it up to my mother and she, would, she wouldn't admit to it either because she was told by my grandma that not to do that because she could end up in a residential school. And, so they spoke French and, and pretended they were French Ukrainian. It was she brought was brought up with that fear, and it just doesn't go away. Even though some of the schools had closed and stuff, she was told she was brought up, don't uh, don't say anything about it. You're French, and that was it. My grandfather, uh, he was a carpenter, and my other grandfather. He also did carpentry. Neither one were, were schooled for it. They just did it. That's the way it was in those days. And I was interested in it. And Dad built his house. And of course, I was right there. 
breaking the levels and <laughs> and getting into trouble, but I, I guess I, I, I had it in my blood. Mount Baker School in Cranbrook, they decided that they might want to get involved with building two full-size carts with the Métis students in the school and the uh, IA teacher there. The uh, Red River Cart construction project idea came about with um, the integration of First Nations learnings within the curriculum. Well, this is a set of plans from Parks Canada about components and construction of a Red River cart. One of the more difficult components here, the wheel construction. I cut pieces in a square and then drew the round circle of it. And to get the strength, I put together two pieces. And here they would have used um, hide glue and stuff like that, but it wouldn't stand up. So what they did was they doweled to hold things together. There was lots of thought put into it. There's, there's no doubt about it. And, and when you're building it, you see that. It, it's just real interesting. It's, even though it's a simple project, a cart, uh, there's lots of uh, engineering into it. Having somebody like Dan who can share the history and can share his struggle doing it recently within the last few years, I think is really helpful to the students to see that you know, it's not an easy thing. It's not something that just sort of came to be without effort. They, they tapered their the axle through here. They would put a taper in it, and I, I often wondered why they did it, and I studied it up as that taper would not tighten. So even though it got full of sand and everything, the, the taper would uh, keep it from seizing and wearing out, because it would just back off back itself off and of course if you had to take it apart it just popped apart real easy it was not a problem to get it apart so I'm learning all the time they even though I'm gonna do some educational stuff with it I I'm learning just as much as they will volunteers like Dan are the lifeblood of local Métis groups across the province if you have skills or knowledge and would like to give back, I encourage you to reach out to your local MNBC office. We're taking a short break, but when we come back, we're heading to Golden British Columbia to speak with Métis musicians Drew and Karen Nagao. So when I started playing fiddle, I played with two youth as well, um, and they've moved away now, but we were lucky enough to open a like a fiddle school. So there's, there's Métis of all ages and non-Métis of all ages. Welcome back. We're here in Golden, British Columbia, a very historic community in British Columbia, and I'm here at the Golden Museum. I want to thank the museum for allowing us to have the whole MayTV crew here today. Catherine and Drew, thank you so much for being on MayTV uh, today with me. Now, Drew, you play the fiddle, so we, we all know that the fiddle is core to the music, to, to MayTV culture. So what drew you into uh, learning how to play the fiddle? So I was lucky enough to start playing violin when I was about five years old and it slowly turned into fiddle as I got more connected to my Métis roots. So how long did it take you to, to learn your, your, your craft and your art form? I've been playing for almost 15 years now. So. Well, now Catherine, you're going to be in a, in a few moments, we're going to get to see the both of you perform. So I know growing up when I was a kid, um, we had my grandfather played the fiddle and we used to, it filled up our, our house. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of accompaniments to the fiddle. So I, I heard the spoons and there were other things. You play the cone. So, yeah. so tell me a little bit, tell our, our viewers what that is. Well, everybody had a comb in their hip pocket like all the guys did. So we used to just use their comb. It didn't seem to matter about germs or anything like that, like it is now. So they, they, and everybody, somebody always smoked, so they used the cigarette papers for the paper for the comb. Right. And so we used to, it was like the old time hamazoo. Mm -hmm. Like they have these hamazoos they have now with the pa paper in them. 
And so I use packing, or not packing paper, but uh, wrapping paper. So could you show me that, just so I can take Yeah. Because it's, it's hard to yeah. imagine, like yeah, when you, yeah. They just had the old pot, same old pocket comb, and the tobacco, they used to just put the paper here like that. And if you didn't want to touch, you switch it out with somebody else with a new new piece of paper. Eh? Mm -hmm. So how did you, uh, you know, when, when my grandfather played the fiddle, he wasn't playing, he was playing by ear, as he said. So, yeah. so when the both of you are playing together, it's obviously not off a sheet of music. So how do you, how do you make that work? You learn the fiddle just by ear. Um, somebody will play, slow it down for you, you watch their fingers and their bow, and you just slowly pick it up piece by piece. And what about you, Catherine? How do you, how do you integrate when you're hearing the fiddle play? How do you know? Oh, it's just to, to hum along. It. You just hum along. So if you're just hum along normally, you just use the comb to hum along. And, and are there other Métis people in Golden that are learning the fiddle and learning those historic kind of connections to our Métis roots? Are you aware if there's anyone else in the area that's doing that? Yeah, so when I started playing fiddle, I played with two youth as well. Um, and they've moved away now, but we were lucky enough to open a like a fiddle school. Oh. So there's there's Métis of all ages and non-Métis of all ages playing. So I was coaching that a little bit before COVID, but. Awesome, well, we're gonna hear uh, a performance from you very momentarily, but I, I just wanna thank the both of you today for both being here. And if anyone is in the Golden area, I know you both would encourage them to come to the Golden Museum and come and see the Métis exhibit that's here because it's awesome. It's not something you see uh, very often. They've had up to 26 students that's awesome. In their fiddle camps. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, congratulations to the both of you and look forward to, to hearing your performance. Thank you. So what they used to do is just put it on like that and uh, blow through it. So the vibration is what gives it the thing. And don't lick your lips. They're supposed to be dry. So what you do is, so I'll play a little tune, and it was a great thing for kids to do because they tickled their lips and they used to make faces. Anyway, so this is the tune that I'll play. And you have to guess it, and I'll tell you later. So, did you guess it? It was Pop Goes the Weasel. We'll be right back. David Thompson came through, and when he came through with the Cour de Bois, I noticed he didn't run right to the trade house to have some rum. He looked around and he noticed some plants, and, and I guess I was feeling shy, because my sister Nancy noticed and said, Charlotte, you speak to everyone, why not the short one? Welcome back to MeTV. I'm here in beautiful Invermere, British Columbia. We're here at the National Historic Site at Kootenai House, and I'm joined here on the show today uh, with Sharon Wass, and Sharon is a local resident. And Sharon, you know a lot about this site. Tell us a bit more. Kootenai House was the first fort built on this side of the Rocky by the Northwest Company, and David Thompson was not here only by himself, but with his wife, 
and his three children? No, Sharon, this site, it's a national historic site. It's got a lot of history, and the, the fort is obviously gone, so it's obviously disappeared. But the, one of the things I noticed here was that David Thompson's wife is not anywhere on any of the signage or anything else. Tell us a little bit about that and what you've done in Invermere to make sure that she gets recognized. It's the truth of a lot of places that the female, females were just not even recognized, as particularly the Métis wives and the Métis families who were a crucial part of the fur trade and all the work they did in the forts. But Charlotte travelled with David for many years and they had three children together. And when they started to get the money together for the 200 year celebration of David Thompson coming, they were talking about putting a, a statue up. And I said, well, it's got to be a statue of both David and Charlotte. Charlotte was here. Charlotte was here with three small children. She travelled across this country in a canoe with small children to be with David. And so I, I talked them into it. I did a presentation to the Historic Society and they, they put her and David on the monument, which I thought was very, very important. Well, that's amazing. And, and that ties into a little bit about what we're here to do and to, to hear you. You, do, you have your own one-woman performance. Mm -hmm. It's focusing in on Charlotte Small, David Thompson's wife. And uh, set this up for us, because we're going to have you do a few minutes of a little... They're gonna, our viewers are going to get a little snippet of what your performance is. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about it. Well, as you can see, this is the, the Kootenai House. And I happen to live just a few miles up the road. And then when I started doing a little bit of research into Charlotte and David, I'd realized they had 13 children together, and my Métis grandmother had 13 children. And all of a sudden, it just seemed like I really should tell her story. So, Sharon, uh, your performance is about 30 minutes. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Sharon now, and we're going to see just but a snippet of Sharon's one-woman performance on Charlotte Small. David Thompson, map maker. <sighs> What a title. It makes my David seem like such a shallow man. What did David Thompson do? Oh, he made maps. Yes, yes, yes. My David made maps. And he was very good at it, too. But there was more to my David than just his maps. My David was a strong man, a good man. He cared so much about all the people that he dealt with and the animals and the plants. He didn't just think of the next drum stop or the next pipe. He always wanted to know everything he could about the people in the land. But I haven't told you who I am. My name is Charlotte Small. I was born in a fort at Isle La Crosse. My father, Patrick Small, was a factor at the fort, and I had an older sister, Nancy, and a younger brother, Patrick. There was so much work to do in a fort, all year round. We were sewing, we were trying to grow a garden, we were gathering food, we were preparing the fort. There was hours and hours of work, and everyone in the fort had to do their share of the work. The year I turned 12 was an interesting year. David Thompson came through, and when he came through with the Cour de Bois, I noticed he didn't run right to the trade house to have some rum. He looked around and he noticed some plants, and, and I guess I was feeling shy because my sister Nancy noticed and said, Charlotte, you speak to everyone, why not the short one? Then, oh, I could feel my face burn, and finally that teasing got so bad that my mother sent us back into the fort to work. That night, I snuck out of the fort and followed David as he went, and he looked at the stars through this little instrument and writing down numbers, and I didn't know what he was doing. After they left, Whenever the name David Thompson came up, I was all ears. I was listening. And it turns out he wasn't just a fur trader. He was an explorer. He could tell you exactly where you were in this whole world just from looking at the stars and doing his little calculations. Well, that fall, my sister Nancy got married to a man she'd never met, John MacDonald of Garth. He was a young partner in the fur trade as well. And the next spring when David came through, he asked me to marry him. So there I was, 12 years old, stepped into the canoe as Mrs. David Thompson. We went down to Grand Portage where all the meetings were and I was quite frightened until Nancy finally came back and said, Charlotte, we're gonna travel together after. So back in the canoes we went and we started traveling all across the country, way past the prairies where my family grew up and into these foothills and these huge, huge, mountains, I felt quite terrified by the size of them. When we got to Rocky Mountain House, David told me I wouldn't go, be able to go out and mingle with the people as much as I usually did, because the Pecani did not want us to cross the mountains. And the next spring, 
when David prepared to go, I had to wave goodbye because I was expecting our first child. Here I was, 13 years old, about to have my first child, and all alone in this fort. Well, I wasn't all alone. There were men there. But Chief Kootenai he sent his wives to help me during the birth. Can you imagine my surprise when six women came through? Six women. He had three wives about my mother's age and three about my age. With these wonderful women, I was quite happy when my daughter Fanny was born. Sadly for David, he wasn't able to discover the Pacific that year. The guide he'd traveled led him on a wild goose chase into a snow-filled valley, and he had to come back. The next year, we were posted to the Peace River country, where when I was 18, our son Samuel was born, and then our daughter Emma when I was 20. And that year, we came back to Rocky Mountain House, and we were to go across the mountains for sure. The next spring, we went across the mountains and found a Kootenai house. That was a wonderful summer. It was still a wide river valley, similar to what I'd grown up in the plains, but the mountains were beautiful all around us. But when we were going back across the mountains the next spring, we had a terrible experience. And I know that's when David decided not to bring us on long journeys with him again. Emma was such a wild wanderer. She was always wandering everywhere. And when we stopped for a break, I was so tired, looking after the three children, carrying my share of the supplies, another child on the way, that when David went to find a place to cross the river, I laid down for a nap. And the next thing I knew, David was shaking my shoulder. Charlotte, where's Emma? Emma? Fanny, have you got Emma? Emma? Emma, where are you? Oh. <laughs> we found her two hours later, up the hill, underneath the tree, so sound asleep that she didn't hear us calling her. I know that's when David decided not to take us on long trips again. We did eventually go to Montreal. We had eight more children. And sadly, within a few months of being there, Jonathan died and then Emma died. I was heartbroken. All those years of living out under the stars, we never had so much as a cough or a sniffle. And within town, we were all sick within months and two of my children died. But David did marry me. We were together for 58 happy years. David Thompson, map maker, yes. Explorer, yes. But kind father, wonderful husband. Most of all, he was my David. Sharon is a lifelong educator and performer. She continues to stage her one woman show throughout BC. Visit her website for upcoming dates. And if you're in the Invermere area, I encourage you to visit Kootenay House and the statues of David and Charlotte Small. And that wraps up the show. Remember, if you want to nominate a Métis person to get featured on this program, get in touch. Also, please note the times and stations where Métis V airs across Canada. You can also watch previous episodes on our website. Thank you for your encouraging feedback, and I'll see you next time. Until then, Mina Kawapamitan. <laughs>